Sponsored by Soundcore Liberty Air 2 Pro earbuds. This is the 20th anniversary Macintosh, one of the rarest and most expensive Macs Apple ever sold. It was so special that it was delivered to you in a limo and set up in your home by a man in a tuxedo. There's a lot of cool history to unpack, and I hope you're ready because we're gonna dive in right now. Hey guys, how are you all doing? If you're new here, welcome. My name is Crazy Ken, and today we have a very special guest here in the lair, the 20th anniversary Macintosh, or TAM for short. It's been sitting in the background just chilling for a while now, but today it's finally gonna get some time in the limelight. So this computer was designed when Steve Jobs was not at Apple, so none of the Jobs vision was inside of it, you could say. But Johnny Ive, was at Apple during the time, and he worked at Apple for many years, so a lot of his vision, plus the visions of a lot of other people, all went into this computer during the 90s. And in 1997, it went on sale for $7,500. Definitely not in everybody's price range, but that was kind of the point. It was supposed to be a special, limited edition Macintosh. So now let's dive into the backstory of the TAM's conception and unique design. Bob Brunner is the man behind the initial concept for what would later be named the 20th anniversary Macintosh. The original codename was Pomona, likely named after the goddess of fruit. Brunner wondered how computers would evolve from a box shape into something more physically compelling that would fit better in the home. And again, the year is 1992, so computers were mostly boxes. Like even Macs were boxes for the most part. And that was because Hard drives and expansion slots needed that room, and the box shape was just what worked. So all of these brains came together, and the concepts started forming. A huge goal for Pomona, according to Brunner, was to encourage people to select their computer the same way they would a piece of furniture or a home stereo. Which is evident when you look at the care and time that went into the sound system for the TAM. So the concepts started pouring in, and the two common themes with the designs were curvy shapes and mixed materials, as the designers were trying to stray away from the traditional platinum gray plastic of Macintosh computers at the time. Personally, one of my favorites is Eric Chan's concept based on Richard Sapper's Tizio lamp. One of the noteworthy concepts in the industrial design group was from Daniel Deulis and Jonathan Ive. Their concept revisited another soon-to-be-released computer, the Macintosh Color Classic. The Color Classic was Apple's first all-in-one to adopt their new Espresso design language, and Dayu, Lise, and I had figured that would be a good model to build on. Behold, the domesticated Mac. And it featured legs, so you could store the keyboard underneath, folding doors, a pin board, small slots for storing floppy disks, and even an analog clock, which pivoted with the door's movement, so it's always facing the user, whether the door's opened or closed. And the idea behind the keyboard storage was they wanted the computer to have a different identity when it was powered off compared to when it was powered on. And the doors probably helped with this too, but when the computer's powered off and the keyboard is put underneath, it kind of just looks like a nice decorative piece of furniture, as opposed to a keyboard and a computer sitting there just begging you to get more work done. And it's also kind of cool to think about how, even today, the whole keyboard underneath the computer concept is something the iMac still does. The iMac's been doing that since the G5 in 2005, so it's cool to see how the history still applies here. So there was some cool appeal with this concept, but in the end, it got ditched. Brunner's curved panel concept, designed from October to December 1992, is the earliest concept I can find which actually resembles the shape of the final TAM product. Another similar concept was the sweep concept by Tim Parsi, which was designed from January through April 1993. And around the same time, Paul Bradley took Brunner's curved panel concept and he made a hard model that he named the B&O Macintosh because it was inspired by Bang & Olufsen. By the summer of 1993, the team narrowed down the selection to five models for focus groups, including the TTO concept and the B&O Macintosh. In the end, Brunner's concept was the winner. And looking back at it, we can kind of predict that if we piece everything together because his concept is already starting to look like how the final product looks. So then Brunner handed his concept to Johnny Ive, Johnny Ive did some tweaks, okay, maybe a lot of tweaks, and then Johnny took his design and handed it over to designer John Johnston and engineer Will Oxford. And together, they made the first working prototype called Spartacus Prototype 1, AKA the computer that Alfred used in Batman and Robin. By the time Prototype 2 came along, the design was mostly solidified. If you look at them side by side, they're pretty similar. 
So what the team was trying to do was, they were trying to make the design a little less dramatic. They felt like it stuck out a little too much. So they experimented with some different colors and stuff, but I never saw any photos of any of those other colors they tried. However, when I visited Hap's prototype collection, I did see a silver TAM on display. So I'm gonna make an educated guess and say that was one of the color material combinations they experimented with. But in the end, they settled with this more bronze type of look, which I think looks good. And the final prototype was completed in December, 1996. So now, after five years of development, it was time to reveal the 20th anniversary Macintosh to the world. At Macworld Expo, January 1997, Apple Senior Vice President of Worldwide Marketing, Sanjeev Chahil, takes the stage and reveals the TAM, resulting in a standing ovation and tons of praise. The response was overwhelmingly positive and the TAM would go on to be one of the most successful Macintosh computers of the 90s. <laughs> Sorry, 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 I couldn't resist. No, that's that's not what happened at all. Okay, here's what really happened. At Macworld Expo January 1997, in front of 4,000 people in a Marriott ballroom, Steve Jobs laid out the floor plan for the transition to the next generation Mac OS. And Gil Emilio talked about something or something. But at the end of the presentation, Senior Vice President of Worldwide Marketing, Sanjeev Chahil, surprised Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and revealed the TAM publicly for the first time. But, uh, it didn't go so well. And with the click of a mouse, you can get your CNN news. And, can we help? The click of the, okay. And also, the, I guess CNN checked out a little while earlier, there it is. I didn't do my sacrifice to the demo gods earlier. <laughs> but even with the computer glitch aside, the presentation was just so uncomfortable. And with that, okay, let me um, let me just wrap up here. I know we've um, thank you. This um, you can put in information about your name and what price you'd like to offer for this product. What? Steve Jobs seriously looked like he wanted to punch somebody. Like, he looked like he wanted to burn the room down. So Steve and Woz were gifted serial numbers zero and one of this computer, and there was a rumor that one of those computers ended up in a trash bin backstage. I don't know if that's true. I think it's hilarious, but uh, that could just be a myth. Steve also wasn't in the greatest mood that day. He was called to present there during that critical time for Apple's rebirth, but there was a lot of chaos and unpreparedness backstage. Plus Gil Emilio, who was Apple's CEO at the time, was not rehearsed at all. So the whole thing was just a shit show, except for when Steve was talking. That was good. Anyway, the computer took five years to make and it was discontinued after only nine months. And there was also a significant price slash down to 19.99 in March. But on the bright side, the TAM was a demonstration of what the Apple Industrial Design Group was capable of and what Johnny Ive was capable of too. So let's stay optimistic and take a closer look at the design of the final product. The 20th anniversary Macintosh featured a one-of-a-kind of Apple design with a thin body, curved face, bronze colors, and a unique keyboard with leather and a built-in trackpad. The metal foot suspended the computer above the desk and it could also tilt, allowing for multiple viewing angles and easier storage. Plus, in traditional Apple fashion, it doubles as a handle and it also provided space for the keyboard to slip underneath. Speaking of the keyboard, the trackpad was actually removable so you could use it beside the keyboard and when you're done, you can snap it back in place if you'd like and you can hide the cables underneath the keyboard with the built-in cable management. One reason why the body was able to be so thin was because the power supply was external, so they didn't have to take up so much space on the inside. However, the power supply was only part of this external base unit, which also doubled as a Bose subwoofer. And I find it funny that on the base unit itself, it's written base, B-A-S-E, but in the manual, it's written B-A-S-S. -S. I get it, homonyms are confusing. 
Additionally, the face of the product featured built-in Bose Acoustamass stereo speakers to accompany the subwoofer, and when those were combined together, the Mac offered exceptional sound. I was talking with Alfred from Alfred.tv, and he made an unboxing video a long time ago about the TAM. I think that was the first TAM unboxing I ever saw. And when we were talking, he told me that he still uses his TAM as a CD player. And to me, that makes total sense. With the four times CD-ROM drive on the front, plus simple media controls and an exceptional sound system, this Mac still works great for music. Plus, it has an infrared receiver on the front, so you can control music with the included remote, or any compatible remote, too. And apparently, there's an FM radio built in. I actually didn't know that until recently, but it came with an antenna that you could screw into the back. I don't have that particular antenna but you can then use the built-in software to tune into stations and play radio on your Mac, so pretty neat. If you want, you can also use the TAM for television. It has a built-in TV tuner and an S-video port. And if you really want to multitask, you can play TV in the Apple Video Player while using other applications in Mac OS. And you can watch all your TV shows on the beautiful 12.1-inch 800 by 600 LCD. Maybe not from that far away, but hey, you get the idea. On the back, there are a couple of air vents, including two cooling fans, so the TAM is really quiet when powered on. As for the I.O., the TAM has the two F-type connectors we were talking about earlier, one for TV and one for FM radio. It has two 3.5mm audio inputs, S-video, two serial ports, an Apple desktop bus port, and a DB25 SCSI port for other peripherals like an external hard drive. And the audio input could also be used, so you can essentially plug in any of your media players and use the TAM as a set of external speakers. Now, the expansion is kind of an interesting story. Again, they weren't going with the whole box shape idea, so, you know, expansion wasn't really an option with such a slim profile, but they found out a way to make it happen a little bit. So, if you look on the back, you can see this hump here, and originally I thought that's just how the computer was designed, but apparently that is an expansion hatch. Internally, it was called the backpack. And it came with the computer, it just wasn't installed by default. So what you could do was you could install it, and then you can install adapters and third-party cards. Sorry, not adapters. Conversion technology. So expansion was an option. You can use these two latches at the base and take off the back panel, or in my case, the expansion hatch, and boom, you have easy access to the inside. There was a COM2 internal slot for other cards, like an Ethernet card, for example, and there was also an internal PCI slot for 6.88 inch 15 watt cards. There's also a cache slot, and in this case, that's where the Sonnet G3 card is installed. So essentially, this computer now has a G3 processor. And hey, if you like floppy disks, there's a 1.44 megabyte super drive built in just for you. Overall, I still like the design very much. Even though it's over 20 years old, I still say it's a head turner. When I show it to people, it's usually a good conversation starter. And one could make the argument that this design led to a lot of other design choices that Apple made in the future, especially with the iMac. And hey, it must have been cool enough to be used in Seinfeld and in Batman and Robin. And again, Batman and Robin had a prototype. I, I'm kind of jelly about that. I'm guessing there's only one of those Spartacus Prototype 1 models out there, but hey, if anybody knows where it might be, give me a call. And now, it's time to take a look at the specs. The specs on this computer are dust. Sorry, I just had to crack out an Elford.tv joke there. Just had to get that off my chest. Okay, for real now. The TAMS logic board used the Gazelle architecture, which was shared by the Power Macintosh 5500 and 6500, so there were some similarities. The TAMS sold with a 2GB ATA hard disk, and this was actually the first desktop Mac to use a 2.5-inch disk, which is usually used by laptops. But again, they needed to keep things small. The TAM used a 4 times CD-ROM drive, which was way slower than other Mac's optical drives at the time, but due to the vertical mount, it had to run slower so it could function properly. In fact, the manual even recommends that you keep the tilt between 5 and 15 degrees so the CD-ROM drive can function. This Mac also featured up to 128 megabytes of RAM and ATI RAGE 2 graphics with 2 megabytes of video memory. And it shipped with macOS 7.6.1 pre-installed, but you could install macOS 9.1 if you want, and that's actually what my TAM is running. And for the CPU, the TAM used the PowerPC 603E, clocked at 250 megahertz. But thanks to the expansion features, some folks, like Brian, who sold me this awesome computer, installed a Sonnet Technologies G3 upgrade into the L2 cache slot turning this thing into a G3 computer. And thanks to that upgrade, maybe I can try installing Mac OS X on this bad boy in the future. I'm actually gonna take a page out of the Apollo 13 book here and say this was a successful failure. 
It kind of failed because it only lasted for about nine months. Steve Jobs clearly didn't like it. <laughs> they didn't sell many. It was expensive. Some would say it's underpowered. But I don't think they were planning to sell many in the first place because I think they only made 20000 if they even got that far, and they definitely did not sell the whole batch. But it was still kind of a flop. But regardless, the success side of the story is that this computer paved the way for future Apple products. And it's a testament to Jonathan Ive and the Apple Industrial Design Group's capabilities and skillfulness. Because this, you could easily say, influenced a lot of the future design choices in Apple products. So I'm going to call that a win. And Johnny Ive worked at Apple for another 22 years after this, so clearly Steve Jobs liked him enough to keep him on board. The TAM is also a great collector's item now. Again, it's a head-turner. And I've heard stories about some new inbox units selling for upwards of $10,000. Even on eBay, there's some used models that are selling for around $2,000. So it's still a pretty special collector's item. And if you can get one, I would consider yourself very lucky. And these speakers, man, even today, over 20 years later, these still sound so good. They're timeless. But speaking of speakers, speaking of speakers, that's an interesting sentence. You know what else sounds good? The Liberty Air 2 Pro. Hey, Ken. Yes, Ken. Did you know that the Soundcord Liberty Air 2 Pro earbuds provide wireless audio with active noise cancellation and 26-hour playback with the charging case, all for $129.99? Hey, that's pretty awesome. Tell me more. Liberty Air 2 Pro features 11 millimeter pure note drivers for superb sound. Combined with customizable EQ and Hear ID, these earbuds produce the ultimate listening experience. So what's Hear ID? I'm glad you asked. Hear ID intelligently tests your hearing and creates a sound profile which perfectly fits your own unique ears. Hey, that's great. I mean, my ears are unique. At least that's what my mom always told me. Exactly. Wait, what? And they also come in four pretty colors. So go ahead and click the link in the description to get your own Soundcore Liberty Air 2 Pro earbuds. And when you use that link, you're also supporting the Computer Clan YouTube channel. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Soundcore, for making this episode possible. So let me know what you guys think about the TAM, and if you have one yourself, I'd love to hear your stories about it. And also, feel free to subscribe for more tech episodes every week, usually on Thursdays. And if you want to help fund the future of the Computer Clan, plus get some awesome perks along the way, feel free to pledge to my Patreon. Thanks in advance for your support. And hey, if you like this episode, you know what to do. So, thank you, TAM. Thank you, Apple Industrial Design Group. And thank you guys for sticking with me. Catch the crazy, and pass it on. Thank you.